In this documentary, we're going to show you how Norwegians celebrate the season of Easter, including unique traditions such as Fat Tuesday, the cabin trip, the shopping trip to Sweden and Easter crime. We'll also take a look at how Christianity arrived in Norway, the origins of the Easter egg and how Norway's most beloved Easter food products aren't actually Norwegian. Hello and welcome to Easter in Norway. First, the bad news. Our county went into lockdown just before Easter due to a rise in coronavirus cases. As a result, I couldn't meet with my Norwegian in-laws, and the streets were virtually empty on what should have been one of the busiest shopping periods of the year. The good news is that we have plenty of footage to work with from previous Easter celebrations. And we've also reworked the format to explore more of the fascinating history behind Norway's Easter traditions. So without further ado, let's begin. The Norwegian word for Easter is Påske which derives from the word Pesach or Passover. Easter is part of a series of dates that mark historical events surrounding the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. There are three distinct periods covering a total of 107 days. Shrovetide, Lent and Eastertide. The first period, Shrovetide, starts on Septuagisma Sunday and ends on Shrove Tuesday. The most famous event during Shrovetide is Carnival, which translates to remove meat. Historically, it was the last chance for Christians to indulge in excess food and drink before Lent, and it was celebrated as a parade or street party. It still continues to this day, with the most famous examples being the Rio Carnival, Venice Carnival, and New Orleans Mardi Gras. In the early 19th to mid 20th century, Norwegians dressed up and celebrated Carnival at parties or masquerade balls. From 1983 to 1986, there was an Oslo carnival that attracted crowds of between 50 to 100,000. Unfortunately, it became marred by public drunkenness and littering. In 1985, the cleanup operation cost just under 48,000 pounds in today's money. In Norway, the Shrovetide period is known as Fosterlaven and features a few unique customs. On Shrove Sunday, there's a tradition based on a pagan fertility ritual, where children wake up their parents by whacking them with decorated birch branches called Fosterlaven Sidis. If they're lucky, their parents will treat them to Fosterlavensbollid A sweet roll with a thick layer of cream in the centre. The last day of Shrovetide, Shrove Tuesday, goes by many names around the world. In England it's called Pancake Day, in France it's called Mardi Gras and in Norway it's called Fete Tisdag Which means Fat Tuesday. That's also what Mardi Gras means in English. With Lent starting the next day, any fresh ingredients such as eggs, milk and butter had to be used up. Add a bit of flour and sugar and you have the recipe for Norske vafler or the Norwegian waffle. Okay, we're gonna make waffles, Norwegian waffles, and it's important to brush the butter onto this waffle making machine. So we have to follow the shape. So you start from the middle and then you go outwards like this. And you just, okay, a little bit more. There, it's ready to close. Sure. Leading Tower of Waffles! We just made our waffles. I think it's about 28 waffles. Hard job. And we got different kind of toppings here. Uh, what we usually do is to top it up with jams. And we also have our legendary brown goat cheese, which tastes like caramel, so it's like a dessert. I'll show you guys actually how you should eat it. Toppings here, clap it like them, the sandwich. Okay, let's dig in. On the off chance you're ever attending a football game in the town of Moss, keep an eye out. You might find hot dogs and waffles being sold there. The next period is Fastetiden or Lent, which runs from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday. As the Church of Norway is Protestant, fasting isn't widely practiced. However, there are a few important dates towards the end of the period. Palm Sunday or Palm Sunday is the day Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. As he entered the city, people celebrated and laid down palm tree branches. As Norway's climate obviously can't support palm trees, the birch tree takes their place. It's also around this time that people start putting up their Easter decorations, with the color yellow being especially prominent. Just like Christmas, there's a flower that represents Easter. In Norway, the Påske Lilja or Easter Lily is what we would call a wild daffodil. In other countries, the Easter Lily is Lilium longiflorum, a plant native to Taiwan and the Ryukyu Islands. Lilies are not only a symbol of the resurrection, Jesus himself mentions lilies in Luke 12:27. Dimmelonsdag or Holy Wednesday is the day Jesus was betrayed by Judas. 
In Norway, it's the last day the shops are open, and it's also when people in the cities leave in their thousands for their cabins or skiing holidays, a phenomenon called Påsketrafik or Easter traffic. Now, we've covered skiing in the Christmas in Norway episode. So let's talk about Norway's cabin culture instead. The Hitta or cabin is an escape from the stresses of modern day life and a base for outdoor activities. It's usually two to three hours away by car in a remote location with limited facilities. That means no electricity, no running water, and in some cases, an outdoor toilet. They originally functioned as places to stay for hikers on mountain trails or fishermen during the winter season. After the First World War, building your own cabin became a popular DIY project, which is why there's a strong attachment to them. In fact, the average Norwegian spends 60 days a year in a cabin. Nowadays, there are 471,000 cabins in Norway, selling for an average price of around 180,000 pounds. According to Statistics Norway, Ringsaker and Trisil have the highest number of cabins. If you don't have access to one, don't worry. The Norske Turistforening or Norwegian Trekking Association has over 500 cabins available for hire. The cabin is also the perfect place to indulge in a uniquely Norwegian tradition, Påskekrim or Easter crime. The origins of this tradition date back to March 1923, when a newspaper ran a story on the front page that said Bergen train looted at night. The problem was that it was actually a clever advert for a book with the same name. The publicity around the incident made the book a bestseller, and for some, a new tradition was born. These days, television stations saturate their Easter schedules with crime dramas and horror films. You'll even find puzzles to solve on the side of milk cartons, a tradition since 1997. When Norwegians need some fresh air, they can go to Poskefjella, which means the Easter mountain. It isn't a specific mountain, but any mountain you climb during the Easter break. Unfortunately, Sarpsborg doesn't really have any mountains, so we're going to the next best place. Appelsintoppen. It's a famous viewpoint with public barbecues and a strangely appropriate name considering it's Easter. You can't have a barbecue in Norway without having pølser or hot dogs. Over 450 million pølser are eaten every year, which works out to be an incredible 83 hot dogs per person. If you want a smoky hot dog, this is the way to do it. The traditional Norwegian pølse isn't served in a bun, though. Instead, it's served in a soft potato flatbread called a lumpa, covered in ketchup and a sweet mustard sauce called senne. It's then topped with crispy fried onions and served alongside a mostly flavorless potato salad. A word of caution to all our Norwegian viewers, though. Norway has the highest rate of colorectal cancer in Europe, which has been linked to consumption of processed red meat. So let's cut back a bit, okay? We're gonna make pinnebrød. Pinnebrød means literally stick bread. Got my stick, got my dough. Start rolling it with both of your hands into a long roll. I'm happy with that. Wrap it around. And then you're supposed to roll it around it. There we go. I got my sugar and cinnamon mixture here. And now I'm just gonna drizzle over the top to make sure it's coated. Try not to make a mess here. It's important to twist the stick around so it doesn't get burnt. And it's important not to put the bread onto the flamey area. You can also use pinnebrød as a covering for your hot dog. Instead of getting pulsebrød from the shop, you can make pinnebrød with pulse inside. Kjærtorsdag or Holy Thursday is the day that the Last Supper took place. It's also the day that one of Norway's more unusual traditions takes place. Harditud is a brief shopping trip to another country to take advantage of lower prices. The name comes from the practice of working class Norwegians giving their children English names. Over time, the name Harry became a derogatory term meaning vulgar or tasteless. The Norway to Sweden trip is called Sverigedag or Sweden Day. The reason it's associated with Easter is because Holy Thursday is a public holiday in Norway, but not in Sweden. As a result, between 10 and 15,000 Norwegian cars cross the border every day during Holy Week, stocking up on cheap Easter food, meat, candy and alcohol, subject to the following limits per person. These t-shirt designs are absolutely awesome. In a 2018 survey, 6 out of 10 Norwegians said they had visited Sweden for groceries in the last year, carrying out a staggering 1.35 billion in cross-border trade. However, if you're expecting a calm, orderly affair, then you might be in for a shock. The Swedish police erect roadblocks to protect residents, deploy police horses, and the government-run alcohol store is shut down. Why? 
because the minority of these bargain hunters are young Norwegians who gather in car parks, wave Norwegian flags, play loud music and of course get spectacularly drunk. To the point where every year a handful of them are arrested for being drunk and disorderly. It's no wonder then that the Swedish have their own nickname for Svedgedag, the Easter Invasion. Using Numbio, we can build a picture of just how much cheaper Sweden is compared to Norway. As you can see, there are significant savings to be made, especially if you buy in bulk. There's also a UK version of the Haritur, where Norwegians take an early flight into Heathrow, catch the tube to Primark Oxford Street, go absolutely crazy and then catch the last flight back to Norway the same day. Langfredag. Or Good Friday is a solemn day, as this was the day Jesus was crucified. It's a day of remembrance rather than celebration. So let's take the opportunity to examine Norway's interesting relationship with Christianity. With a little research, I discovered several surprising ways in which Christianity influenced Norwegian culture. From 1736 to 1912, confirmation was compulsory in Norway. Without it, a Norwegian subject couldn't get married, enter the military, be a godparent, or be a witness in court. To be confirmed, they had to pass a public exam, and if they hadn't passed by the age of 19, they could be sent to prison. In 1814, the Norwegian constitution had a clause that said, Jews are still prohibited from entry to the realm. It was rescinded in 1851, reinstated in 1942 by the Quisling regime, and rescinded again in 1945. In 1919, Norway held a referendum on the prohibition of alcohol and incredibly, the public voted for it. Prohibition was originally a Christian movement that blamed alcohol for domestic violence and poverty. It was later overturned in a <clears throat> second referendum in 1926. In 1979, Norway banned Monty Python and the life of Brian for blasphemy. Sweden naturally capitalized on this by promoting it as the movie so funny it was banned in Norway. But that's in the past I hear you say. Things are different now. Well, it was only in 2012 that the Church of Norway officially split from the state. According to Norwegian law, not only does the king have to be from a Lutheran background, but until 2012, half of the government's cabinet also had to be Lutheran. The previous year, a new Norwegian translation of the Bible was amongst the best-selling books in all of Norway, topping the charts and selling almost 160,000 copies in just over a year. According to Kaifo, a Christian research institution, 11% of Norwegians read the Bible on a weekly basis. Of course, when religion and money come together, there's always controversy, and Norway isn't an exception. If a Norwegian is born and one of the parents belongs to the Church of Norway, the child automatically becomes a member. This practice, which still continues, is controversial because the state funds religious organizations based on their membership numbers. Multiple figures are quoted, but it looks like it's 900 krones or about 75 pounds per person per year. During 2010 to 2014, with increased immigration from Catholic countries such as Poland and Spain, the Catholic Church in Norway took things a step further. They used the telephone directory to find names that appeared to be Catholic, looked up their social security numbers and added 65,000 names to their membership without letting any of them know. The Bishop of Oslo was charged with fraud and although he was later acquitted, the Catholic Church had to return 3.4 million in membership fees, pay a £170,000 fine and a further £25,000 for the state's legal costs. Christian symbols are very much a visible part of daily life. The cross of St. Philip the Apostle adorns a Norwegian flag and several county flags feature symbols of Christianity. Until I started working on this video, I had no idea what the Church of England logo looked like, but in any town or city you'll notice the Church of Norway branding. Even if you never attend church, in my city you'll regularly receive a newspaper in the post box called Church News. Nine of the 12 public holidays in Norway are based on Christianity. Seven of them are linked to Easter and two of them are linked to Christmas. As Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday and Easter Monday are all public holidays, Norway actually has the longest consecutive Easter break in the world at five days long. Additionally, on Good Friday, no commercial adverts are aired on television. Norway has a Bible Belt which has strong support for the Christian Democratic Party, a centre-right group that opposes gay marriage and abortion. Although it received only 3.8% of the vote nationally in 2021, in West Agde it received 13.9% of the vote. Even swearing in Norwegian has roots in Christianity. Here are a few common swear words, the literal translation and its equivalent term in English. In English, these phrases sound completely harmless, but in Norwegian they're amongst the strongest statements of profanity. Growing up in the UK, I have to admit my own views on Christianity had been damaged by the Catholic Church sexual abuse scandal, American evangelical preachers squeezing money out of their congregation and African pastors performing so-called miracles. Would Norwegian Christianity be different? Well, as my wife is Christian, I soon had the opportunity to join a prayer meeting. Now, I'm a Sikh with no concept of what it would be like. Would it be like this? Usque ad mortem infidelium Dei gratia Or this? We gonna do something about this election stealing the border speeders eating godless demon crabs in their out of godly vaccine mandates. 
Instead, I was pleasantly surprised when a group of older Norwegians showed up at the door with home-baked cakes, got settled in and started playing hymns in Norwegian with live instruments. Even without knowing the language, I was encouraged to join in. In a culture with a reputation for being cold, it was eye-opening to see how Christianity could be inclusive, diverse and foster a sense of belonging. In summary, Norway's thousand-year relationship with Christianity is a complex one to untangle. From a British perspective, it's fascinating to see how prevalent Christianity is in Norwegian daily life, albeit in the form of cultural artifacts rather than actual worship. If you're Norwegian, what are your thoughts on Christianity in Norway? Let me know in the comments. Påskeaften, or Holy Saturday, is the day Jesus' body lay in the tomb. In Norway, Påskeaften starts quietly, but over the course of the day, the mood shifts as families gather to share a meal together. It usually consists of vegetables served alongside either roast lamb or rakfisk, which is fermented trout. In the past, food stores would be running low after a long winter, which meant Norway's Easter food traditions aren't as prominent as Christmas. However, over the years, some foods have become associated with Easter. In pagan times, the egg was considered a symbol of fertility and rebirth because the increase in daylight hours and warmer temperatures meant chickens would lay more eggs. For Christians who have been fasting for 40 days though, the egg is not just a symbol of new life in Jesus' resurrection, it's also a very welcome treat. In 2011, Norwegians consumed over 35 million eggs over the Easter period, or about seven eggs each. The tradition of decorating eggs comes from the Christians of Mesopotamia. Eggs were stained red to symbolize the blood of Christ at the crucifixion, a practice that continues to this day among members of the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Easter bunny was first recorded in Germany in 1682. It was actually an Easter hare that hid multicolored eggs in gardens for children to find on Easter Sunday. The first Easter egg hunt is said to have been organized by revolutionary monk Martin Luther for his congregation. We couldn't talk about Easter eggs without mentioning the infamous Fabergé eggs, which were Easter gifts created for Russian royalty. This particular translucent enamel egg is called the Scandinavian egg and measures just 74 millimeters high. In 1980, it was rediscovered in a bank safe in Oslo amongst the possessions of Maria Quisling, the widow of the Nazi collaborator Vidkun Quisling. Chocolate Easter eggs were first developed in France in 1725, and Cadbury's created the first hollow chocolate Easter egg in 1875. However, in Norway, you won't find the Easter eggs that us Brits are used to. You're more likely to get a paper mache egg filled with oddly familiar chocolates and sweets. You see, during the last century, there was a strange illness, Plegiaris copycatus, that exclusively affected Norwegian food manufacturers. They would send staff abroad, usually to the UK, to sample foreign chocolates and confectionery. Nobody knows how or where they got infected, but we do know one thing for certain. Once they returned to Norway, they would develop an insatiable desire to reverse engineer what they had eaten abroad, and manufacture it in Norway without any regard for copyright law. The incubation period for this disease was extremely variable from one year to almost 40 years. The first case was discovered in 1906, when Freya's milk chocolate bar was released one year after Cadbury's dairy milk in 1905. After that, it was an absolute free-for-all. There were Norwegian copies of the Mars bar, Terry's chocolate orange, Rolo, and M&Ms. I emailed Freya about the release date of their chocolate orange, but I didn't receive a reply. I think they're onto me. This image was sourced from a wonderful Facebook group called We Who Want Freya Chocolate Orange Back in the Stores. Are you listening, Freya? Give the people what they want. There was even a case at Nidar, where they released the Stratos exactly one year after the British chocolate Aero. In 1999, Freya created their own version of Cadbury's Cream Egg, the UK's best-selling confection between New Year's Day and Easter. Freya's version is called the Porsche Egg. This case of Plagiaris copycatus is noted for its unusually long incubation period of 36 years. The main difference between the two is that the cream egg has a white and yellow fondant filling, while the Posca egg has a milk cream filling. Of course, the most famous case of Plagiaris copycatus during the century-long epidemic is Freya's Quick Lunch, which was released just two years after Roundtree's Kit Kat. Fun fact, the place where Kit Kat was originally manufactured, York, was once a Viking settlement called Jorvik. Freya makes 50 million of these every year, and the average Norwegian eats nine of them in that period, three of them at Easter. It's marketed as a snack ideal for hiking and skiing, with the slogan Tur chokoladen, translating to the trip chocolate. Inside the wrapper, you'll either find a recommended hike or the Norwegian mountain code. After Cadbury was bought by Kraft Foods in 2010, it actually joined the ranks of Freya, who were bought by Kraft in 1993. 
This led to several classic Cadbury products being rebranded to be sold in the Nordic markets. Next we have Solo, Norway's national soft drink, which also isn't technically Norwegian. A Norwegian businessman Torleif Gullikserud obtained the recipe from a biochemist in Spain and brought it back to Norway in 1934. Funnily enough, that same biochemist would sell the recipe to another businessman who would later launch a drink in France that you might have heard of, Orangina. Back in Norway, the soft drink was originally called Narangina Solo, which meant oranges only. Eventually, it was renamed Solo, and it was Norway's most popular soft drink until Coca-Cola took first place in 1960 and Pepsi took second place in 1999. Just as the clementine is associated with Christmas, the Appelsin or orange is associated with Easter in Norway. One theory is that Easter was the time that the sweetest oranges would arrive on ships from southern Europe. Another theory is that the fruit resembles the sun, which in a country where some parts don't see the sun for several months of the year, is a welcome reminder of the promise of sunshine. On average, Norwegians will consume a tremendous 20 million oranges during the Easter period. I just want to give a quick shout out to Circle K's orange and dime flavoured bolle, which wins our bolle of the year. Viewers, today we're going to make a roast leg of lamb. It's uh, a fine specimen, we found it in many. Mm -hmm. They lived a wonderful life in a fjord or mountain farm somewhere. In a fjord, it's not a fish. <laughs> ah! Today it's going to fill our bellies and tomorrow come out the other side. So, wife. <laughs> All right, let's do it. After defrosting for two days, pat the joint down with a paper towel to remove excess moisture. The marinade is simple. Four tablespoons of olive oil, four teaspoons of salt, two teaspoons of black pepper, and one teaspoon of garlic powder. Engage in some light foreplay with the joint. Before placing it in a preheated oven at 160 degrees Celsius. The best way to ensure a perfectly cooked joint is to use the temperature probe placed to the thickest part of the joint. Set a target temperature of 65 degrees Celsius, which is medium well, and wait for the alarm. Cooking times will vary depending on the oven, but for our four kilogram joint, it took about two hours. I boil the potatoes for 15 minutes and now I'm going to give them a bit of a, of a rough and tumble. You can see how this edge is a little bit fluffy. Yeah, that's a good sign, so those will crisp up when we put them in the oven. Viewers, and especially you Norwegians, please stop boiling your vegetables. I've seen the stoic look on your faces while you dutifully eat those mushy veggies that have been boiled to hell and back. It breaks my heart. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's to make a habit of roasting vegetables. Not only will you get a better flavour through something called the Maillard reaction, they'll actually be more nutritious because water-soluble nutrients won't disappear into the water. For every 500 grams of vegetables, add one tablespoon of olive oil, one teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of black pepper. Toss them until they're shiny and the salt and pepper are well distributed. For potatoes, onions, garlic, carrots, and other root vegetables, let them cook for about 45 minutes in total. For tomatoes, bell peppers, and broccoli, put them in the oven during the rest period for about 20 minutes. We're doing a final blast, 20 minutes, 180 degrees. Gonna get nice browning on the edges with this. I'm gonna carve the slam leg for the first time ever. Ooh, okay. There you have it, viewers. The perfect roast leg of lamb. Oh, it's dripping. Look at all that juice. Let's check on our vegetables. Take a look at this. Caramelized onions and garlic, crispy roast potatoes, and an assortment of root vegetables that will taste like candy. Don't forget to save all those delicious meat juices, throwing a few tablespoons into your favorite gravy for a flavor boost. Finally, carefully plate a serving with a silly presentation for those social media likes. I think we need more grape, yeah. The last period to cover is Eastertide, which lasts for 50 days, from Easter Sunday to Pentecost. On Påskedag, or Easter Day, the mood completes its shift to one of celebration, as this is the day Jesus was resurrected. For most Norwegians, Easter Day is similar to Christmas Day, in that it's a public holiday where people spend time with their friends and family. However, there are a couple of notable traditions. The Easter egg hunt and Påskefrokost, or Easter breakfast, which typically consists of a breakfast buffet featuring eggs, pancakes, bread, and oranges. Here are a couple of ideas for your next brunch. The full recipes will be in the description below.
Easter Monday is an ordinary public holiday in Norway without any notable traditions, which means we've reached the end of the episode. If you enjoyed the video or learned something new, do consider subscribing to the channel as I'd love to reach 1000 subscribers by the end of the year. Don't forget to check out our other content filmed in Norway and I'll see you in the next episode.